Hey, this is your host V from Creative Block. I will be representing Creative Block at Lightbox Expo in Pasadena, October 24 to 26 at table 505. Come say hi and grab some free merch. On to the episode. Welcome to Creative Block, we're your hosts, V. And Sean, a.k.a. Lord Spew. We interview people in the creative industries about their life, work, and hobbies while we doodle jam. We asked people on our social medias if they had specific topics they wanted us to discuss, as well as some drawing prompts. If you want to support the show, make sure you like, subscribe, and comment on our content. It helps push our videos to more viewers. And subscribe to our pre- Patreon if you feel generous uh link in the description of this episode today we have with us a special guest is adam dix nice to meet you talk to you see you hello uh nice to meet you talk to you see you as well (laughs) the so the audience can't see you and uh the audience can't see me so it's kind of like a little secret that we share with each other Ah. (laughs) (laughs) over here that's true. We keep the guests hidden from the audience. Adam, we've it's so funny. We were just talking like right before we started recording that we've known each other for a while because we've we've met through Instagram. Yeah. The long forgotten days of when you could find new artists on Instagram. Yeah. Oof. 10, 11 years ago, maybe. I think you had just moved to the States and I just moved to LA. Mm-hmm. And it, <laughs> we were just looking for friends <laughs> and we were like hey who wants any coffee it, it worked out all right we actually only just this last year worked on our first show together but yeah i've been following you for a while is that a secret it's... unreleased thing or can you can you guys talk about it well i think we can't really talk about it because it just got canceled and it was not oh. announced so <laughs> You heard it first on Creative Block, y'all. That you'll never um, hear it. it. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, you know, the industry and everything, it's so nuts. Yeah, because we, we had been at, on, at Netflix at the same time. I remember you were on Arlo when I was on Captain Fall, I think. Uh, I was on Cuphead. I was oh, on- you were on Cuphead. Oh, my God. Yeah. Uh, you were on, what were you on? Captain Fall, which is an adult animated comedy. Very dark. Yeah. Did you work with uh, uh, Jeremy Polgar? I, I did. I don't know him particularly well, but yeah, we did work on the show together. He was on the boarding side, I believe, and I was actually doing props and effects on that show because they needed someone who knew some squash and stretch. And I was like, I could use a job. I will do this. I will learn how to animate effects. And Are you I the did. squash and stretch guy? Is that what everyone knows you as? No. Uh, <laughs> I think it's somebody who wasn't doing character to do who could do character and do props and effects and they asked me and i said sure mostly i I like the property so i was like i'll do whatever you want like just let me let me draw on this yeah it's it's interesting because you're i know you mostly as a character designer and but you have like a you can you can draw any i think you're a super versatile i feel like there's a lot of sometimes i could see a designer getting stuck a little bit in a in a, a specific style but i feel like you're like super adaptable from the type of shows that you worked on thanks uh yeah i mean i i i would credit that to the fact that i get very bored very easily and so i am more interested in looking at styles and trying to like solve the puzzle of how to be effective at designing them and doing special poses so i you know i've worked in 2d i've worked in 3d i've worked in realistic i've worked in super cartoony which has been honestly very very fun because i'm never bored then you said you were you you moved to we both got to la approximately at the same time where did you move from i moved from san francisco i went to college up there and then i worked in the video games industry for a long time for probably about nearly five years and then we all got laid off and i was like well i don't want to work in games anymore so i'm gonna give my attempt at working in animation mm. what did you do in games i worked for like a mobile game company that actually was disney interactive they had an office up in the bay area and uh i 
would design, I would paint, I would animate, I would storyboard. Like it was very much focused on kind of a, a general skills position with a heavy emphasis on being able to paint very realistically. And I will be the first to tell you that I am not a painter, nor do I necessarily like to paint all that much. <laughs> I'm much more interested in acting and performance and things of that sort. So I was like, this ain't my job. I don't want to try and find another job that does this again. So I went for the animation and it kind of worked out. That's so interesting. Why why did you pick design over boards? As you said, it sounds like you were, you were boarding a little bit on these games, right? I mean, very roughly. I didn't... Okay. <laughs> to say that I boarded is really just giving myself a compliment of a skill that I probably can't claim. <laughs> it was out of necessity more than like my actual ability to do it. But I had taken like a storyboarding class in college and I was like, yeah, I know what this is. I think too, like, I don't know. I, I didn't have the, the breadth of knowledge of just like what it takes to draw mm -hmm. or like functionally communicate in a drawing like I do nowadays that nowadays if I sit down and animate because I studied 2D animation mm. now if I sit down and try and animate like it comes at a level of ease that I can't believe <laughs> because it never did when I was in college sure, and now sure. I'm stuff like that that's super easy not super easy at all but I like the functionality of communicating energy and communicating yeah. flow and communicating design through multiple frames in motion now mm -hmm. comes second nature and it used to there, i think there's also something to be said about working on someone else's show or uh another project and then going to work on your own thing and like the amount of freedom like and and lack of scrutiny that like you mm -hmm. like 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 i i feel like you f you can feel very free animating you know on your own for your own stuff after a while of working on a different production because you don't have someone else's like rules or notes. Yeah. I mean, I think that there's certainly something to be, I'm, I'm very lenient on myself. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> I think job is because I don't sit down to draw and like, I don't hold myself to a lot of criticism or preciousness. I'm more interested in like, does it make me laugh? Does it make me feel does mm -hmm. like, I'm a I'm a huge subscriber to like the Walt Stanchfield idea of like an ugly drawing is more effective than a pretty drawing if it feels good. Yes, mm -hmm. like, yes. yes. I I'm a I'm a big ugly drawing fan. I love ugly drawings, and sometimes ugly drawings are are more funny than mm -hmm. a well drawn drawing. And there's no way around that. And yeah. I, I know that there's some drawing purists, especially when you get into like the like the real cartooning side <laughs> of, of of this industry. Like you'll have people on shows who, you know, they've worked at Disney their whole life or whatever, and it's like the perfect silhouette, the perfect design. But sometimes an ugly design just hits. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I'm I'm also a big like Glenn Keane nerd, and I think he was having a conversation once with uh I think Frank Thomas and they were talking about Little Mermaid or something. And Frank, I guess, goes, Well, we certainly wouldn't have drawn it like that. And he goes, What do you mean? He goes, well, there was just some real ugly drawings in there that just didn't feel very appealing. And he goes, Well, I'm much more interested in drawing something that feels real than something that looks nice. And I just was like the the gumption and the gall to say <laughs> Thomas, which I was like, That's so funny. okay. I mean, he really earned the respect to do it, but like, well done. That's I agree. You know, that's so funny. Yeah, I like these discussions. It's funny to think about all of these kind of like discussions that happen between like the like big Disney animators. Like you know, it's like almost a gospel of some kind. And you're yeah. and you know, we all like listen to it with like I don't know tremors. Like I can't they believe they said these right. things. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And now I'm like thinking about that, and I'm like, that's. I mean, of course, we don't work at Disney, but. 
I don't know. It's kind of it's it puts like a different perspective after you worked on in the industry. I think. And to most people, you look at the drawings and it's perfect. But to them, in between them, they'll be like, "Well, you put like yeah. for the reaction on this one frame, you put a little bag under her eye, like she like can't believe what she's looking at. We would never. That's not aesthetically pleasing. Or like the the pinky isn't out on this section, so her hand looks less dainty, and that looks ugly. You know what I mean? Like, but it's stuff that we wouldn't notice most most of us at least. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's it's really weird getting to a point of capability to when you're at a stage where you're able to see, where you understand that what you feel isn't maybe something that you can explain, mm -hmm. but you know how to get that feeling or you aim for it and just sort of hope that it lands there. Yeah. Yeah. It's really challenging, but it's the part I like. How did you, um, sorry, I'm going to like take the conversation somewhere else, but I kind of wanted to take it back to uh, you going from games into animation. First, can you tell us how you landed the that gig in, in games? Like, did you apply through a website? Did you reach out to somebody, you know, what was, what was it like? I mean, if I'm honest, every job that I have received has been through a recommendation and that even includes my starting job in, in games. I think the only one I ever got was my very, very, very first game job was a place called Uga Labs that was also in the Bay Area. And I just was like, I need to find some sort of way to make money over the summer while I'm in college. <laughs> and I was like, well, I may as well try. And that one I got and actually met Bill Robinson, who is a designer now in animation. Uh, he was, that was his first job and he and I were working there together very early on in our careers but i went back to school so i wasn't like i didn't finish working there but um I, that was my first job but the second job at disney uh which is what i left school for was um a recommendation through uh, an old school pal of mine uh, named charles he recommended me for the job he coached me on the portfolio and he was going to be like my direct art director at the time so that made it a bit easier mm. and i was there for yeah nearly nearly five years met a lot of really cool people and one of them was a friend of mine who worked on one of the teams that I worked on whose dad happened to be a producer of a show at Disney TV and once we got laid off I was like well I need to try for animation and essentially reached out to her to be like, hey, I am not finding anything. I just need someone to look at my portfolio. I would like to just like know what I need to do. And so she asked her, her dad and he offered me a job and I got started as a character designer on my oh. very first, the industry, which is, I know very atypical for this career. And I was very fortunate to be able to do that and have basically been working as a character designer since. And it's one of the it's unfortunate in the in the sense that like well, my students are like so what does it look like to get this job and I was like I don't know I uh -huh. don't know what it means to like have to try but if I were to figure it out I would recommend like learn how to do prop design learn how to like design principles apply the same throughout yeah. if, if you're gonna have to clean something if you're gonna have to apply big medium and small give space for the eye to breathe make sure that there's clarity in the angle or what it is the object is like it applies to character know that there could be squash and stretch we can do special poses like it's the same sort of stuff so i mm -hmm. i mostly assume that that is the correct route i know a lot of story artists also end up going into character design and vice versa character mm -hmm. artists end up going into storyboarding i think that more comes from our love of of acting and performance mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but yeah i don't know I don't honestly know like what the direct route is because I've not taken it. Well, I feel like your entry, your entry is just as valid as as anyone else's in my opinion. Yeah. I'm, I mean, I think that it's just an example of like you never know where your first job is going to come from. Yeah. It, it, it never hurts to ask around to at, to talk to people to make friends with people because certain people know other people and you never know what your entry mm -hmm. point is and there is not just one like i'm gonna strong arm talent I'm, I'm gonna just be the biggest prodigy possible and have the most perfect portfolio sometimes it really is like you have the skill plus you found a door i agree i think it's i feel like your story adam is actually way more relatable and probably true to what it to what getting in the industry 
is like. I kind of want to give a quick shout out to Margot Pierce's episode because I think that was also an episode that was very much kind of like you know you meet the people and you 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 like apply and all of that and i thought you send an email. I, I, <laughs> you know? yeah you send emails you reach out to people i think that's that's actually a uh, a way that is almost like a more what's the word organic or or real way of getting a job well, it's people centered it's it's centered yeah. around being social around people around networking which is a very important part of getting into animation i don't know why my dude wants a hot dog but he wants a hot dog <laughs> <laughs> i don't know <laughs> someone like threw this hot dog and he's he's trying to like dive to get it before it hits the ground Better he checks the hot dog himself <laughs> that is so funny so yeah so what was your first gig out here actually uh the first job was on sophia the first which is a 3d animated show on disney jr mm -hmm. and that was a really cool job. I was on it for two years, which is nowadays a bit more atypical when it comes to how long these shows run. But uh, yeah, I worked, I designed props, I did some storyboard cleanups and breakdowns, I did illustration, I did product design, I did character work. They really had me like all over the spectrum on that and i was initially brought on because the showrunner for it was supposed to work or was supposed to build another show called elena of avalor so a lot of my early stuff for that was working viz dev to develop this other show oh that's uh, cool it was super cool got to hang out and like talk with the writers and figure out sort of what they needed and wanted and what their goal was for you know these secondary characters and this sort of God, asking a lot of questions on are we doing stuff about like is this kingdom spanish colonial is this are we dealing with like incan and mayan and aztec cultures like what is the balance you know asking a bunch of really fun mm -hmm. fun fun questions as far as that goes anyway so yeah i was working on a lot of uh a lot of different <laughs> of these different shows i was kind of getting my understanding of the pipeline and figuring out you know what the different jobs were how they looked it was a really good learning experience uh overall and i'm extremely grateful for how uh, jamie mitchell like introduced me to the side of of animation that you know on the artistic side of like what actual animation work looked like where before i was coming from games and mm -hmm. ideas of how things should be <laughs> but didn't actually have any real idea so can you remember a lesson that you learned early on like that helped, like some sort of lesson that she taught you? So Jamie, Jamie was oddly hands off. He just kind of let me run and sort of figure out what I liked and what I wanted to do. And like the fact that there were like two years worth of work for me to like get assignments, but also like have enough time to play and design. Like, I think the thing I learned most effectively was that I really didn't have quite as much to worry about in terms of my skill mm. Mm. or jumping in. I think that we all kind of have this expectation that we should, especially if you're coming in as a, as a designer, that we should all draw at the level of what these art of books look like. Mm -hmm. And the reality is, is like, no, those are the best of the best. And like to expect that you will only be ready to work when you can draw at the level of say Corey Loftus or Ryan Lang sure. or whomever, that mm -hmm. that's what makes you a valid artist. And the reality is, is like that's not true at all. It's there's a broad variety of skill sets and there's so much specialization that maybe you are really good at color and maybe like that is your in. Maybe you are really good at clean up like clean lines and maybe that is your in. Or maybe you are really good at performance and maybe that is your in. But the reality is is like at that point in time, I thought I needed to be Corey Loftus. I thought yeah. I needed to be able to and draw and do all this stuff. And I would put myself through torturous hours of painting. And I don't like painting. <laughs> <laughs> I I was kind of needless. Like I should have focused on what I really enjoyed and what I gained. What I, I would have gained a lot more skill quickly had I focused on the things that I love doing as sure. opposed to focusing on the things that dude I cannot emphasize what you just said enough I feel like that is 
that I relate to that so much. I feel like I spent so much time of my of being in college and my early years and my career where I was just like, I just got to get better at everything and all these things that I hate. And it just made me never want to draw. <laughs> right. I mean, I think more than anything, like in my class too, like I think going to art school has tremendous benefits. And I think the thing that students often forget is the biggest benefit you have is the people that you meet when you're at school. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Those are the people that are going to get you jobs. Those are the people that are going to help sort of encourage you. But the reality is, is like trying to learn all of these really tough skill sets, which are useful and all have a kind of a time and a place is that we often think that we all need to learn it the same way. And all of our minds work really, really differently. And therefore, like what what might come easy to somebody might not come easy yeah. to you. That doesn't mean that you're less valid of an artist. That just means that you have a different perspective on the world that is easier to access. And what your job is, is to find out what that is so that you can effectively communicate with the world as a creative and be part of making it something different and something yeah. more. So I think ultimately sort of growing into this understanding that like being an artist has a lot more to do with understanding yourself. And V, you and I talked briefly at, at the cafe mm -hmm. about sort of how much psychology really plays into the importance of you know being able to access what we do and it's no different like as an instructor so much of my time is mostly just checking in with students and helping them learn how to learn how they right. learn mm -hmm. as opposed to like beating them over the head with like these are the hard skills that you need it's like yeah those are the hard skills that you need but like is there a way that you can enjoy the process of learning to get there rather than feeling like you have to just like grind and destroy yourself yeah. to find it. Something that uh, it took me many years, I think, to learn was like, I was always really interested in like the, the idea of being a generalist, like being able to make full shorts by yourself. But the problem with that is you're doing like 10 jobs and trying to get good at all of them. And mm -hmm. at first for like many years, I feel like you're going to be bad at, you're going to be bad at all of them and then like kind of good and then medium good at all of them. And then hopefully someday you can be like passing at all of them. And I feel like everyone at the beginning wants to be good at everything. And mm -hmm. there can be such like a value in just getting really good at one of those things at first and allowing yourself the, the chance. Otherwise, yeah, you're, you're like, Hey, I'm like kind of, medium bad at all these things look at my portfolio of a billion things that i'm like half decent at you know yeah it's a hard thing to put on yourself i, I now i now claim that i hate painting as like a point of pride <laughs> <laughs> no. well, well is that because you like flat work or is that because you like flat color stuff or is that because you don't like painting it's it's <laughs> that i find i find that thinking about the mechanics of physics really tedious if mm. i want to be a mathematician I would have been, but I hate math. And therefore, if I'm sitting here wondering like to what percentage of light is being caught by this wooden object and what kind of wood is it and how much light is going to pass through it that we're going to see and how much of light's going to bounce off, what the heck is bouncing off of this thing? And to, like, yeah, it's yeah. a puzzle that doesn't interest me, but the puzzle that does interest me is like, but how does this person feel? And how can I effectively mm -hmm. communicate like, where can I place the arm? Where can I place the brow? Where can I place the chest so that not only are they feeling it, but now I'm feeling it because I'm I'm accessing my empathy. That's just a much more interesting puzzle to me. And therefore, the means of accessing that for me comes through gesture, comes mm -hmm. through acting, through performance. Now, some people access that through their lighting and their color. And I think that when they're effective, it's unbelievable. I have yeah. tremendous respect for it. I just don't like solving the puzzle that way. And I think mm. that's what I mean of like finding the way that it works for you, finding the yeah. language of learning and creating that is functional for you. Now, I, I know that you're a teacher. Um, I was uh -huh. curious about since you've become a teacher, have you started viewing learning new things that are outside your realm as like less of like a like um like a personal I want to do this and more of a like I want to learn this so I can pass this on to my students or do you still just kind of learn the stuff you want to learn 
That is a very good question. I think a lot of it is, uh, it's a bit of both, I would say. I like to learn just as a general rule. I think, you know, I think as real metaphorical, mm -hmm. as artists, our entire job and our entire goal is to not necessarily, like what we create is a byproduct of our growing and learning. I think inherently all artists are just students for the rest of their life. And, you know, as problematic as say Picasso is in terms of his life and all that, I think that there's something to be said for looking at his work and saying like, here's a person who started with realism. Here's a person who started with a very traditional sort of method and then chose to change it which is a great place to start. But if we notice through his work, he went through multiple phases of what those changes look like. Mm -hmm. It was general abstraction. Then it was, what if I remove like realism? Can, does the, does the thing still work? Okay, cool. It does. Now, what if I move, remove all other color and then only work in blue? And then you go through his blue period and it still works. And then he goes, what if I remove all color together and just work in value? And then you get his black period and you're like, oh my gosh, it still works. And as he progresses, he's like, what, what about primitive art? Like, what about how we look at cave paintings? And then we can sort of see that, you know, <clears throat> these drawings of bulls that are really minimalist still read as bulls. And then he goes through the study of like drawing hundreds and thousands of bulls to try and figure out these puzzles that he's making for himself. And I view a lot of being an artist as a lot of that. Uh -huh. It's, mm -hmm. it's our job as artists to be students and feed our curiosity and ultimately explore humanity through the stories that we want to tell and the stu the struggles that we're trying to solve. Mm -hmm that ultimately leads us to want to or need to learn how to gain a new skill or a new method of speaking that allows for us to find the desire to learn uh, in another means. So on one hand, I think inherently, yes, I learn and I grow because, and I study new things because I'm inherently curious. But I also am very practical. Like I learned how to animate turns which has become now like a standard in the animation industry which is really cool but like to be able to go back to these animation skills that i honestly was very insecure about because i really struggled with them when i was learning to animate and then suddenly i'm realizing that like oh cool i've learned so much about drawing that now animating isn't very hard or it's not as hard and, and difficult to achieve, but I also am utilizing this as something that my students can use and therefore are going to be ahead of the curve when it comes to applying for jobs later. Yeah. That's so true. I feel like what you just mentioned about like having to draw all of the turns and everything. So much of character design is so deeply technical. I feel like a lot of people and myself included when I when I started in animation I thought character design was just coming up with the the shape of the character and design but then I didn't realize how technical the job is can you tell us a little bit like what it's like being a character designer like on the job like do you have you ever had like a job where they were like okay well you're the turns kind of guy or is there like a good blend of like special poses versus turns and can you Tell us a little bit like what those entail and how you think about it. I, uh, it really just depends on the job for sure. You're, you're spot on with that question. Some of, some jobs are really technical. The most recent job before the one that you and I were on the, mm -hmm. uh, was the new Watchmen feature that's on uh, HBO. And that job was purely technical because they're like, oh yeah, the design's already done for you. Mm. It's a comic book. And I was <laughs> That that opened up a whole lot of conversations of like Gibbons, who's a brilliant draftsman and does this lovely work, <laughs> also is rather inconsistent with his model, right? Mm -hmm. But, you know, granted, he should be allowed to be. He had to like draw a comic every week that had multi like a whole chapter involved. Like it's, it's so much work. So then it yeah. became a question of like, okay, what version of Dr. Manhattan is the version that you want? What version is yours from the book that like you're very like attached to versus what version am I really attached to? Like those are two different 
drawings. So we had to discuss that. And then once we found out what those were for like the showrunner and the art director, then it was just really technical. So we were given scenes. We were then given specific panels to be like, I want him to look like this version. And then all we did was turnarounds for like six months. Whoa. We, yeah. Very, very quickly, too quickly, some would some would say. But yeah, uh, that job was extremely technical. And I would say 3D in particular is much more technique than it is design, at least the ones that I've worked on. I, the other 3D shows I worked on being Sophia the First, mm. Lane of Avalor, and Boss Baby. Boss Baby, the TV show, right? Uh, so those were mostly like design and work on turns. And like, we're not doing really any special poses at mm. all. Uh, whereas the 2D stuff is much more, you know, it's design and turns and special poses dependent on kind of like what the level of need is by the, the vendor studio for animation. You know, do they need special poses or not? Uh, you know, how much help do the animators really need from me as the designer? there's just a lot of questions to be had. I personally prefer and love doing special poses. Like mm -hmm. that I think is my bread and butter, but like I can do turns. And I'd say most of my working career was nothing but uh, turns. So when you teach uh, your students, do you kind of like put a lot of emphasis on, on turns? I do one lecture on doing turnarounds and then they have to accomplish doing turnarounds. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> but they finish my class they have done at least four turnarounds mm. at the end of the semester because turnarounds are one of those things that like the first time you do it it's such a headache it's yeah, just dude, it's technical it sucks <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> like no life and the biggest complaint i usually hear from the students is like is this okay like it's <laughs> my character is suddenly dead like it doesn't feel alive and i was like yeah that's the turnaround like it's yeah. doing it and it doesn't need like this is about it being technical this isn't about it being alive save that for the expression sheets so i i then point out like you just got to make sure that it that everything is measured properly that you know your your pivot point is accurate for uh for the design and yeah then yeah generally speaking everyone everyone does it fairly well like it ends up being rather solid which is impressive to me that they, <laughs> and to be fair, like I always like, I'll do the demo and then I'll be like, Hey guys, like uh, go look at BAM animation. They actually have the, like my whole lecture just on YouTube. So just, <laughs> if you get lost, you can certainly go there and find the answer uh, that you need. So there's a lot of resources, but yeah, they, they have a I week to do. You've, you've uh, done something with those guys, BAM, BAM animation. I've actually never, never had. No, I, I know Max very well, or fairly well. We've been in each other's circles here and there, and we both have taught at Art Center. So we have a lot of cross-pollination. But um, no, I just have a lot of respect for them. Oh, so you're just recommending their their version of tutorials? Yeah. On like, that thing. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, um, specifically on turns. Like, Max's Max's turn tutorial is excellent. It's, yeah. it's really nice. It's, you know... It's basically how we are all doing turnarounds. And I think that, that was, the method that he's using was developed on Rick and Morty for these live action for, for these uh, animated turns that now have become second second nature for the industry. That is crazy because I was thinking about that. On the show we were on, a uh, design would often turn in like GIFs of the turnaround. So for anybody listening who's wondering what that looks like, it's like a huge, almost like a letter-sized document where you have the turnaround still, but you also have a GIF part of the document where the character is spinning. And I was just like, that's so crazy that we get to see the, the character spinning on the yeah. sheet. I don't know. On like a teaching side of things, the fact that like I get to like, and now you've actually all animated something as to my students and like it makes doing the turns a little less tedious because yeah, it's fun. If you're yeah. a technical artist, like a turnaround is a headache and a half. Like Renda but said, it's a gift in, in human mm -hmm. animation. Yeah. I enjoy them a lot more now, but I think it's because they're much easier than they used to be for me. Now, uh, how do you um, deal with, or what do you think about 
um, stylized turns, like like for instance, how Mickey Mouse's ears never are viewed as flat from the side. They're always circles facing frontwards. How do you view um, doing turnarounds that have kind of stylistic shortcuts like that? Oh, I love it. I think those are the most interesting kinds of turns to work on, mostly because they present an, a, a puzzle yeah. that is very unique to that specific show or that specific character um and sometimes the, like it might work in a turnaround it may not work in like on show mm-hmm, it, mm-hmm. there's so many different methods of sort of considering it and thinking about it <laughs> i just saw dr manhattan with the juiciest butt <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was gonna try to make his butt glow a little bit um, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I I like I like those kinds of turns. I think yeah. that limitations in in design ultimately make much more fun challenges. And I would much rather problem solve than just sort of do the expected. Meanwhile, like sometimes those challenges are like cool. So Doctor Manhattan in this show has has a heck of a lot of Gibbons lines, as we call them, which are just these little like hash marks for like the mm. muscle. And, and we had to track every single one of those for the three. No. So like <laughs> the turnaround that would normally take me like a day or two. This one took me like a <laughs> solid like week and a half, and I was like, every single one is on a guideline. Every single one is like, oh my god. So that yeah. is crazy. That's the kind of stuff that we don't really think about sometimes. You know, like especially as board artists, where we don't really think about like the technicalities of thing we just we just kind of like draw like the the shape of the character like on model but just yeah. like not all of the details like that is crazy <laughs> you think oh okay every, all the artists are just gonna wing it all the way down the line <laughs> and you will hope that it turns out good yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> i think the challenges nowadays in particular is the fact that we outsource so much of like our actual animation that mm-hmm. like that's why we have to be really specific is mm-hmm. like outsource studio ultimately is going to try and do their absolute best to do exactly what you asked for mm-hmm. so you better give them a really specific thing about what you're asking them to do or else you're going to get exactly what you sent <laughs> and sometimes that's great and sometimes that's not but there's not a lot of room for like thinking anymore it's kind of been removed from the animator's job which is really unfortunate because as as we sort of saw in like the early 2000s and the 90s like tv animation had this really cool thing where like you could do ren and stimpy and part of the goal was to design it as like bonkers as you could but nowadays like tv animation won't let you do that they they'll they'll send it back for a retake or the animator will be too anxious because they don't want to lose their job to take a risk i wonder for something like i mean obviously everybody listening i'm pretty sure knows how what's the word like controversial the ren and stimpy show and the creator are and we've had an episode with um chris mitchell's episode number i forget but he he worked he worked on ren and stimpy and and talked a little bit about i think they animated in house they animated here in the u.s and i i don't know i keep kind of wondering what we could do one day to kind of make it happen again i don't know i do think there's having the animators a team and being able to do the retakes mm-hmm. on the spot is that would be the, the dream that would be the dream yeah. chris mitchell but, uh episode 61 of creative block i don't know if we've ever had an in-house have you ever worked on a show adam where there was like a in-house animator maybe um i have but like they were more unfortunately they were mostly there for like retakes and Retake, retakes of- right Mm-hmm. I've worked on some shows where they animated it all in the house, but it just depends on what kind of show it is. Usually, I feel like a lot of adult animation stuff gets animated here, especially if the show's like Scrappy or if it's like Adult Swim. Oh yeah, if it's a tit like mouse that. show, but my, I could see that. My first two jobs on shows where it was for Fox ADHD. It was a show called Stone Quackers and a show called Lucas Brothers Moving Company for and and they showed on like Fox and FX oh, that and one's stuff. Fun. 
<laughs> but so so for those jobs, for both of those jobs, I storyboarded on those jobs, and then when I was done storyboarding, I would move over and I, I would animate on those shows, and we did everything in house. So there, I think there are certain studios, especially smaller studios, that do that stuff. And to tell you the truth, I I know that there's going to be some trade off with like if you hire like an overseas animation studio, they can do it for cheaper, but at the same time the amount of communication that you get with the animators the fact that the director can meet with the animators and go over things like the animators can ask storyboard artists questions about what they meant for a scene yeah. like that stuff is really valuable and can prevent a whole lot of like mishaps and large revisions and it's kind of unfortunate that we uh, are forced into si- kind of creating these barriers in between the parts of the pipeline I agree. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I mean, even even on Cuphead, like we had some people on there who were storyboarding who really should have been like, or who were also like, basically storyboarding was just keyframes. Like they were animating yeah. full sequence. The final scene in Cuphead of the Devil Dance Battle versus Chalice, it was entirely boarded. It was entirely animated, basically by the Jeez. board artist unbelievable to watch and we were just like how and oh i'm blanking on his name but ultimately did just like an unbelievable gorgeous job and we were like cool do that <laughs> like there were <laughs> there wasn't really much to say aside from like i can't believe that this is this is what we're doing yeah that's the thing it's it's both like really cool to be able to do that in the boards but it's also like Ugh, like you know like we have to still have the same amount of time <laughs> yeah 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 it's like and you can probably pull it off for one episode and then for the next episode you're burnt out and yep. then you're like Bleh. yeah it's like so tricky doing these these gigs when wait so when did you start te- uh, teaching adam uh i started teaching about eight years ago at art center vicky ying was teaching a character class back in the day and she had me TA for her once because she was going out of town for something. And yeah, I, I did the TA position once, maybe twice. And then she was like, I think I'm kind of done doing this. Do you want to take over? Like the students seem to respond well. And I was like, heck yeah, like I really like doing this. And I would say, I don't know. I, I, I feel like I'm a decent artist. I think the instinct of like what I do more effectively, like I feel like I'm a good teacher. Like this, this part for me is where like, I really can lean into my instincts and just like access sort of like the needs of the student and know what they need to learn and make it so that they enjoy it and it's fun, but also they like, they learn and they progress and they sort of learn how to teach themselves and become less reliant on sort of trusting that the academic system is perfect because as I'm sure we all know it's really not and Mm -hmm. who I've ever spoken to who works in this field is very much like oh you know you get as much as you put into it you like what what you choose to get out of it is what you're going to get out of it and I can't I can't deny that I think that's the most true situation with with anything with learning that you know I would much rather teach my students how to learn and by means of instructing them on how to do character work your students are so lucky to have you and one of the reasons why i say that is most of my teachers when i went to school had not done very much in the industry or had much professional experience at all they kind of went straight to being teachers and the fact that your students get to ask you like real life a- applic- uh, like application questions of how this would be done on like a show or in a pipeline is so so valuable in a way that is kind of hard to explain like there's like teaching someone how to animate or how to design and then there's teaching someone how to animate or design as it would be relevant to like a real life application on a show and i feel like that's very important I mean, I, and I think, I don't know, I think you guys would probably agree. I think every every problem that we go to solve in any aspect of our jobs or, you know, our projects, 
very much have a lot more to do with us trying to find interesting and new solutions to things right. more than just needing to know how to like make a ball bounce or how to sure. make a leaf fall like that that stuff is useful but i think oftentimes we were assigned to those projects in an aspect of saying like cool like learn this skill okay but no one ever said why we should learn that skill right. mm -hmm. yeah big takeaway for me as a teacher is being like oh man i wish somebody had been like this is going to be useful for these reasons therefore like learn how to utilize this skill it may not ever be used in the relevant way but like use it have it in your have it in your toolbox so that you can use it when you need to so that you can understand waveforms when you need to so that you can you know effectively communicate rather than all you're communicating with learning how to do a leaf fall is that you understand the physics of a leaf and understand eases now if someone said, hey, you need to understand how to how to ease, and I would have said why, and they would have said because that allows for a much more subtle performance. It gives you places for the character, the audience to breathe before you, like, oh, yeah. my brain is up. But for me to just be like, hey, go, go animate a leaf falling, like, sure, that's great, that's fine, but no one ever told me why. And I think that's, yeah. that's the thing, is like, I would much rather present problems to my students to be like, there's no grade, involved i'm not going to give you an a b c d e whatever e uh i'm not going to give you a grade based on this because you've never learned how to do this before what i'm going to do is present you with a series of problems that you then have to find the answers to that i will give you lectures to help you find the answers to but at the end of the day you've learned how to solve a problem rather than yeah. learning how to do a specific task I think, I think what breaks your brains even more is when they learn their stylistic ways to make the leaf fall too. There's like oh. there's non-realistic ways to make it fall that also take advantage of animation. That's really cool too. Yeah, I think so often as students though, we're also taught that like we're taught that everything is like math. That everything is like ah, there's only one solution, right. and it's like mm -hmm. wrong. To be able to go to my students and be like, cool so-and-so did it this way and guess what they're right and so-and-so did it this other way and they're also right <laughs> therefore there is not a right answer therefore for you to get like a perfect leaf fall with like the right ease is like it's right. irrelevant did you did you learn how to do the drawing did you enjoy the process of the solving so that that's a lot more about my ethos of just what it is about how i teach just oh, that's awesome that's really awesome i i agree i think that would that is the kind of stuff that I wish I, I had a little bit more of as like I went to school because I, I do feel like sometimes it can feel a little bit like well here's the assignment do it and then you get a grade and then you're just kind of like why 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 did I get the grade that I got you know <laughs> or you know like why are why are we I don't know I feel like it's really easy to overthink things when you do art because it, like you said there's no right answer so you're just kind of like it's easy to kind of like spiral into like, is this, am I doing this right? And it's like, yeah, I, there was one student, I, I still remember his name. It was a uh, Jimmy Simpson in every class that I had with him. I always admired that. Um, he took whatever assignment that he got and he would bend it so that it would still apply to what he wanted to work on, but he would work. He would make a thing that he wanted to make, but using, what that assignment required so like it, it might require like a little bit of going above and beyond or something like you like for that leaf assignment it might have been like okay there's a falling leaf but there's some you know there's someone riding the leaf or, 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 or like it's like a cool motion graphics thing with a whole bunch of leaves that form into a logo or whatever it was and i always really like he had the he always had the best assignment the coolest looking shit like like at the end of the day and i could tell it was because he liked what he was doing and he turned each assignment into something he liked doing what's your view of like people kind of taking and sculpting an assignment into something that feels less like homework and more like something that they would make on their own i i'm a hundred percent in support of it you know i think i'm very upfront with my students that like there are certain things that we need to accomplish that you need to learn how to do. And if there are things that, if there are places that I need for them to 
follow along with just sort of what's been given to them just so that they can learn the skill, then I will inform them that like, this is one of those assignments where it's really just about you learning the skill. But the way that I set my class up is like my midterms, I, I hold on to the reins quite a bit. And I say, okay, yeah. you're going to do a group project. You're going to do it with somebody. That way you guys have support from each other. But like you were assigned a musical. I'm going to pick the musical. I'm going to pick the partner because I'm going to be looking for the things that you can learn from each other. Mm. And I'm going to say that you have to follow exactly what the, uh, sorry, I'm putting a foot like right where you're No, 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 I can move. My guy. <laughs> I, I'm going to move my guy. You have to like the, uh, the narrative has to remain the same. You can't change the location as any of us who've taught know that our students <laughs> love to be like, well, what if it's set in mainland China? And you're like, this is yeah. a big thing. <laughs> yeah. So there's a lot of that, but I will I will first be like, okay, there's a time and a place. And like for any job, you will be required to accomplish what the job is. So I'm going to treat the midterm as though this is a job. That's now, good. the style that you guys develop the method you guys go through and find the the answers, the the way that the answers come about, like that is up to you, but I'm going to put certain restrictions. Now for the final, they get to do whatever they want. The only restrictions are, you know, you have to do a lineup of five characters. They have to do three turnarounds and do two expression sheets or three, two, three expression sheets. Mm -hmm. And that's, I'm like, since you are going to be given the opportunity to do whatever you want, I just need for you to, we're going to play ball. We're going to live within like a structure for like five weeks. And then the last five weeks are yours. So I I love the idea of making it relevant to yourself. I like the idea of making it sort of a project that is feeding your curiosity and interest. I also think that there's something to be said for learning that like a job is a job and you need to be able to do it. Yeah, that's super so, important too. Sure. I, I do both. Is it's essentially my idea. Yeah, I think that's good. I agree. Cause I feel like there's so much about working a job that's just like sometimes, you know, that's not how you would do it. And that's not how what you how you like to do it, but that's what the job is. Like yeah. like I feel like for boards, a lot of the the way I could kind of make a comparison with boards is like sometimes you want to do up shots and down shots and it's like nope not on this production you can't do it here so it's kind of like it's good to kind of work within rules also during school to be like all right sometimes it's just you you do what the boss tells you to do <laughs> right yeah yeah well i'm looking at your drawing it, it looks like a um a gesture drawing how often do you do life drawing what's your relationship to life drawing and in relationship also to design if I'm honest, I would spend every single day of my life doing gesture drawing if I could. I, I, I don't do it enough. I will be the first to admit. I love to do it. I will usually get maybe maybe one or two sessions per semester, so which is really not that much. And then, yeah, I the irony being is that I force my students to do like a hundred gesture drawings every week, and <laughs> yeah, but I do feel like okay, what when you were doing the most gesture drawing of your career, like how much was it? I would start every morning on like line of action, or I think it was pixel lovely before. And I would, I would do it every morning for at least an hour. And then I think the challenge with any of that, that I think people struggle with is like, eventually when you're, when you're sort of being motivated by your own interest and curiosity, that becomes not very interesting. So then it's really a matter of like, how do you present new challenges for yourself? And so that's where I really learned to be like, oh, no one's ever going to see the model. So I can just change things and just use these as points of reference. That was really, really helpful. So then it became this sort of challenge of like, how do I push the story? How do I effectively like make this more interesting for myself? But yeah, for a while it was, it was every morning for a solid probably year to nine months. <laughs> also, if I'm like feeling really sad about myself or I'm going through something in life and I like when I lost, when, when I got laid off uh, from Disney interactive, I moved home with my parents and I was like, I am not in a good place. Mm -hmm. I prospects. I don't know what I want to do with my life. So I just went to a cafe every day and just sat for like hours, just drawing 
gestures and the people that were there and I got I got much faster at it but I I just I don't know I enjoy observing life I enjoy I enjoy observing gestures I enjoy the process of just sort of the problem solving of it but yeah I don't do it as often anymore I will try to go at least once every or even if I'm doing it at home I'll do it like once every I don't know two weeks Mm -hmm. I really enjoy like I wish I had more opportunity and more time to do it yeah I agree I feel like when you were saying like it's a good thing to do when you when you don't really know what to do I feel like that was definitely me when I was like art blocked for a while in in France and I was just like I felt like all of my personal art was wrong or whatever I would just kind of like go life drawing and that would give me like a sense of like nice like I have an, a goal I completed the goal I have a lot of drawings that I like by the end of the session it feels like very um I don't know it's like taking back a little bit of control and then and then you get better also by the end of it I think too the fact that it removes the place of like needing to think of like what do I want to draw today like it doesn't matter some something's already been given to you to do yeah so just do that and then you will have drawn that day. And I think part of the reason why I did so much gesture drawing in those times was it was, I'm very much a firm believer in like, all right, well, as long as I keep drawing, then eventually the skills and the second nature will kick in. And there's some truth to it, but only to a certain degree. And mm -hmm. I needed to kind of just get my fundamentals functioning and really just sort of trust the process and the system of just doing it a lot, then it worked out great. So you are also, so we, we talked a couple of times on this episode already, uh -huh. you and I, Adam, we worked on the same show and the show has been canceled. Nobody will know what it is. Rest in peace. Just because we're not going to say, but when that, you just said that you were, you went just drawing a bunch when Disney Interactive, like, like, yeah. like, yeah, like was over. So what are your plans for the kind of unknown? Because I think right now the animation industry is like in a weird spot. A lot of us are kind of, you know, hurting and stuff. So what's your... My plan is I I'm fortunate enough that like I can sustain myself at the moment with my teaching, uh, mm -hmm. which is great. It's not the reason why I teach, but thank God it's there because it would be very hard otherwise. As far as how I'm going to be spending my time, aside from just like reaching out to people and looking for work, like I have over the last year, some friends and I wrote a feature and we are going to, I'll have time to do more, more work on that. Otherwise, like those same friends, like since we have finished the writing portion of of a movie now we're like, let's like, we're all friends. We're all looking for work. Like we all have skills and mm -hmm. are all sitting around waiting for permission from studios to make something why don't we just pool our skills and make something because we can and we have taste and we have studied story and we understand characters mm -hmm. and we know how to do all this stuff so in the meantime for the fun side of things it's a lot of we're working on a short film and We've just taken our first our first screening of the first pass of the boards, and we've just analyzed a lot of the stuff. And no are... way, that's crazy! Yeah, you that's have a like... full animatic for a feature? No, 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 for a, oh. for a short film, like it's like a nine minute a for nine a sequel. Minute. That's still right, amazing! That's so wow, that's so cool. How many of you guys are doing it? There is a group of probably. I mean, so I have a movie club that I that I host every every week at my house. And there's 11 of us who attend the club. And so we were all just sort of talking over the last year and being like, well, why don't we try? So there's 11 of us, but some are animators and some are lighters and some are, uh, we don't actually have any story artists, but we have a writer and we have two writers and a, a lot of viz dev people. So it's very much just like, well, let's utilize the writer's skill. Let's, for those of us who are working on character work, like let's see if we can also pick up some skills in terms of boarding and the fact that we are part of a movie club that watches a movie once a week and we all sit around and analyze it like it has been very very useful it's very fun so there are 11 of us but in terms of like those working on boards and stuff like that it's just me and uh my buddy mark 
And we also are intending to like, we're going to animate it ourselves and we're going to do the backgrounds ourselves. Wow, that's so cool. That's so cool. That is so awesome. And also like watching all the movies together, I'm sure you guys kind of like figured the kind of themes or tone that y'all gravitate towards. Yeah, I mean that's that's a lot of how we started the short was like what is a like what is a story that we would want to tell? Like what is something that we're kind of trying to figure out? What's a what's a question that we think is worth asking that we could then work on a story to try and ask ourselves how we feel about those questions or what we value, you know. So a lot of the things that we've sort of come up with that either, you know, got left or continued into the short like it's mostly just finding out what's relevant to us as a group and what sort of you know we're having fun with asking questions and not feeling like we need anyone's permission to make a thing so that's awesome that is so cool how do you go about starting something like that because i think that's that's probably the situation that most of our listeners are in kind of decision paralysis how to start how to work up a enough of a schedule to even be consistent like how do you start a a big project like that that is so long that's going to take so long and especially like how you know how how do you get a group of people (laughs) together that aren't going to flake out i guess those are the two that's a that's a great question and i will i will say that they're the having the consistency of like the club of just like having you know the fact that we meet once a week We know we're going to meet once a week for just a fun thing. And the benefit is, is like all of us are really like, we've been friends for a long time. My buddy Luai, we went to college together. So when he and his wife moved down here, we just started seeing each other once a week. And then we're like, why don't we like do something with seeing each other once a week? And it can be something as simple as watching a movie. And we're not watching the movie together. We're just having watched the movie so that we have something to talk about when we arrive. It's oh, basically, that's cool. Oh, cool. It's basically a book club, but like yeah. not as long at most. So it makes it really, really easy in terms of commitment. And then after about nine months of us doing this movie club it grew because i had tas who were interested in coming and i had you know there were friends on on all sides who ended up wanting to do this with us just as like a thing to like hey it's really fun that you guys get together and maybe we like could i come i love talking about movies so yeah it it all started from that and just i think part of the trepidation a lot of people have when it comes to having these kinds of projects is this necessity to find people that you can commit to or like can't fight with. We had the benefit of just having the casual element. The fact that we were already talking about film as much as we were made building this little production crew really easy for us. Mm -hmm. And it was based on mutual respect and mutual taste. And we had spent a year getting to know what each other's taste was through the movies which was which was great. It made it really easy for us to kind of know how to work together and know how to build a story, know what everybody's taste level was. And then out of that now, like I have now been, they've, they have voted by committee that I'm now the one who's directing this film. And now I'm having to like learn new skills <laughs> in terms of delegation in terms of also just in terms of boards, like yeah. just what, what works, what's, what is the clarity there? Mm -hmm. Uh, but it's been really fun. I mean, I think the fact that all of us have jumped into recognizing that we're all learning new skills and we all have patience for each other to learn those skills is really good. Mm -hmm. The ability to go and actually like trust that someone's going to accomplish the thing that they're going to accomplish. A few others have stepped up to kind of live in a more production side of it just to like keep things on track but like there's not really been a necessity and most of the time now that I'm the one being sort of forced to direct the thing you know hey do do you want me to like t- like tag somebody and be like hey can you check in on on the progress on this thing and I'll be like no like they've been moving over the last week like they don't need us being on their back for whether or not they've got the the like their part of the board done like this is going to take however long it takes and that's okay because the point of this is that we're making something as friends the point of this isn't pipeline the point of this isn't 
Mm -hmm. it's, it's not about festival. It's not about whether or not it's going to like meet a deadline. Like there is no deadline. Our deadline is we get to be friends. That's the deadline. That is amazing. That's really cool to hear like little, like stories like that of like community and like finding, you know, like a project to work on together. I know that's something that like from my friend group and just other people that I know in the industry, we tend to, it's, I hear a lot of people struggling to find the motivation and, you know, time to work on personal projects. So it's cool to hear like your, your side of, of how you kind of went about that particular problem because I feel like sometimes you know working in the industry you know coming home to to draw more it can be kind of like hard sometimes absolutely it can I think it helps to compartmentalize the importance of things like mm -hmm. the work stuff I'm able to just sort of go this is not something that I'm doing for me therefore for me to put like a hundred percent of my like body and soul and care and passion into something that I don't honestly have the final say in is too much for me to handle mm -hmm. because ultimately I and I have been in situations and on shows where I'm like oh that is not how I would have done that and that was my character and now it looks like this and I just have to take it because it's not my job mm -hmm. I realize like I can't I can't invest that much into something like that mm -hmm. which I think leaves room for me at the end of every day to do my own kind of working on my own sort of stuff. But also to like, when it comes to this movie club, there's, or this, this short film, like, you know, what really helps is having a commitment to other people. Like if you have the commitment to yourself, it's, it's useful. But I think the fact that like, there are other people that I'm aware are waiting for me to accomplish a task for a thing that we're all working on together. And if I'm the one who drops the ball for this thing that is like, we all love this project. Mm -hmm. I might need more time, but I should be asking for that extra time if I need it. I shouldn't, I shouldn't be dragging my feet. Mm -hmm. You know, and again, I think that that that's what comes to the friendship side of it is like, if I need the time, I will ask for it. If I need the the help then I will ask for it and like the group of people that I I'm doing this with like are extremely well trusted individuals that I love tremendously and so being able to just be like hey guys this whole thing happened I need I need a break for a little bit they were like totally yeah of course you know but I also love them enough that like I want I want to make this thing with them I want to build these stories with them. I want to explore these narratives with them because I I value their input, not only artistically, but in terms of what the greater narrative we're telling is. Mm -hmm. You know, we came up with a story together. This was a challenge that we presented ourselves of these characters going through a, a challenge and a struggle that we all fought for. And I, I hold enough value in the story and I hold enough value in them that like, Finding time is really easy when my motivation is to care for my friends and make something with them. Mm -hmm. That's great. Like finding accountability in others is also like, yeah, that's a really great way to, and like, you know, especially when you know that like everybody's like waiting for it. Uh, that's very cool. They're going to listen to this and I'm going to make them cry now. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, I wish they would hurry up. I wish uh, that <laughs> yeah. uh, we give them all the feedback now, like in, passive aggressively through the podcast. Yeah, right. Like they've really been dragging their feet. Thanks, guys. This is really be great if you loved me enough to finish your no. Uh, <laughs> I, the irony is, is now it's it's really on my shoulders currently because we we sat down and like talked about the notes that we had after the first watch of the animatic, and now I'm like, cool. Now I have to sit down and like break down the scenes and like figure out who's going to do what for the redraw like the the reboarding yeah. side of things i mean directing is hard so yeah yeah more power to you is this your is this your first time your first experience directing it is though i will say i think a lot of like the side of like my teaching side and like the the working with other people and like leading projects through the teaching has really done a wonder a wondrous amount in terms of like my instincts i feel like are pretty well honed for the people part of it 
but yeah, it is it is my first time. Which the fun thing is, is because we all know that, like the conversation of like, okay, guys, I just need to be really straightforward with you. The way that I see this short film, the way that I'm I'm designing these boards is I literally just close my eyes and I just imagine like if I hit play, what happens? And then I just draw that. It's just like this is how it worked in my head. So let's just hope. And for the most part, it has worked. And I think part of that comes from the fact that we have spent so much time studying other films and like from the weird stuff to like the really iconic stuff that we've begun to like we we're already speaking the language because of the movie club. So it's mm -hmm. I feel like we somehow inadvertently trained ourselves effectively to know how to communicate this stuff. What what films would you say influenced what you're doing the most, if you had to say? Oof. That's a great question. Uh, I would say there's a lot of, in terms of like the claustrophobia of what we're building, a lot of In the Mood for Love in terms of the compositions. I love that you're catching farts in a, in, in a jar. <laughs> we're, we're filling them up. We're filling up these <gasps> fart jars here. I love it. I now know what this man is holding. It's going to be fart jar. Mm -hmm. so yeah in, in the mood for love in terms of some of like the claustrophobia of some of the shot designs uh there's a lot of <laughs> oddly i would say there's a bit of there's a bit of blade runner in there in terms of some of like the height stuff that we're doing in terms of the emotional resonance and performance and probably a lot of the cutaways i'm leaning very heavily on some of the subtleties of after sun yeah those those I think are probably the closest thus far. That's awesome. That's yeah. very cool. I think it's helpful That's... to have a direction or like a thing that you're modeling a, a little bit, or at least a, if you had a vibe board, you know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that is that is sort of what the most fun part has been is like <laughs> in the discussions. It's like, oh, this oh this could be done like this. Like this is this is a metaphor that I've not seen done like this before. But like. Maybe we could utilize it like this and then problem solving for the clarity of like whether or not it comes across and, you know, what do, does the staging need to change for a thing to to read and then looking at, you know, looking at things like, uh, what did we watch recently that I was geeking really? Oh, I would say a lot of like inherent vice, like the cinematography in that a lot of the shots are really, how do I phrase it? They're good. They're expected shots, but not like they're expected shots in terms of like when they cut to a reverse and things of that sort. But the angle with which it's shot is close, but not exactly where it normally would be and is always facilitating the composition in a way that adds depth. That is really lovely. I think oh. that really surprised me. I think it's confirmed that I like Paul Thomas Anderson's films. Have you guys seen it? I have not. That. It's a weird one, especially because I think what I like about his movies is that they are oftentimes movies that you assume you understand the point of, and then it takes a really different approach or like a different path. And you're like, wait, this movie is kind of just about nothing. And it's a scenario of like bonkers characters living in LA and what it seems like he's doing has more to do with the fact that he just wants to tell bizarre stories in LA and I'm kind of on board for it like it's just really nice I mean sometimes I feel like we gotta lighten up about our hooks you know what I mean like at the mm -hmm. end of the day your hook can be very simple like what's the reason why you want to make this film at the end of the day do you just want to have a cool setting that you're familiar with with you know like kind of familiar characters that feel like the kind of people that you grew up with like on the street or, or whatever it is and i think that's as good of a reason as any to yeah uh, make a film yeah i recommend that though like with that with that ideology like i think that that would that that would place you into somebody who would enjoy that film like it's it's very specifically like or maybe like this can just be fun because it it works and the dialogue is delicious and the <laughs> like live into it like Josh Brolin is so fun in that movie in such a bizarre way <laughs> such a good 
such a good performance out of him. We do have questions from our listeners. Oh, from our patron, Puzzle Glum. What is the most encouraging thing to see a student do? Like something in their art practice or their attitude? Oof. What is the most encouraging thing to see my student do? Is that the mm -hmm. question? Yeah. So maybe something like something where you you're probably like, oh, that's a good attitude or like that's a good practice that they're doing and it makes me feel good that yeah. it makes me feel like they're gonna get it. You know, you're like I it's working. That. You're like, yeah, you know. Yeah. I think <laughs> seeing my students draw ugly is the moment of like, okay, cool, you've let go enough to let the ideas flow. And by that, I don't mean that like the drawings aren't good or tight like I, I don't want them to be tight i'm much more interested in a scratchy drawing that really effectively like explains the narrative and i think as soon as like a student really begins to be like oh i did this because like i thought it would be it would be clearer for like in terms of the performance and i'm like okay cool like you're speaking the language you're understanding the point of drawing is to communicate rather than just like but does it look pretty mm -hmm. will you mm -hmm. like my and then what's really going to make me like sing for them, I think has more to do with like when the student stops caring about my opinion about something and cares about their own opinion, because yeah. that, that switch is really fun because then they're suddenly excited to draw and they're excited to like explore those moments I think are the most fun for me. It's just like, oh, okay, cool. Remember how like you were a kid in a playground and like you could play pretend. I, I want to get your opinion on something. It's tangentially similar. Yeah. It's one thing that I have noticed with graduating students that can be kind of a paralyzing thing is um, I think that over the course of treating this like homework over the course of getting approval from teachers and stuff like that, that when they leave class or when they leave school and they are going out into the world they lose they, they lose that thing sometimes that's like this is why i wanted to make a cartoon like do, do you have any ways to maybe combat that feeling that students sometimes are left with where they go into portfolio mode and they they get this feeling that every single thing that they has to ma have to make must be so perfect and must be a portfolio piece and the next thing they, they make has to be the thing that, that gets them hired and oftentimes i think that actually limits how much how many things they're making what they're yeah I, I, or have you not noticed that that's also okay um this is my bias no i i absolutely have i i think that that yeah. I mean, I don't think it's any mystery. We all have to some degree, right? It's very much a case of we all try and want the job so bad that, you know, we think that we have to like work hard to earn it. And I think that we often forget, like some jobs do just want you to be a wrist. Some jobs do just want you to like do the job and get it done. And those jobs are great when you're starting because they prove that you can do it and you can get credits that's the kind of job that you are building a portfolio piece mm -hmm. for, which is fine. But at the end of the day, it's not fulfilling. I think that there's something a lot more important about building your portfolio by using the kind of work you want to be doing. And the only way that you do the work that you want to be doing is by playing. So I think I think that going into portfolio mode can be beneficial, but I also think that going into portfolio mode can be very life challenging and kind of soul sucking. Yeah. And I think oftentimes, like when people go into that phase, they forget to play. They forget why they did this to begin with. They feel the need to be validated by like, ah, oh, finally someone hired me, and therefore like, I'm worth it. I always end my semester by reminding my students that like at the end of the day, every job is just a job. It's no different than working at McDonald's. You have a, a thing that needs to be accomplished. And if you have the skills to accomplish it and know the right people to like recommend you, then you will get that job and you will do that job, but it will not satisfy you. So my encouragement is to like be curious, be a student and realize that your whole life your career 
is your entire life. As an artist, you are meant to create and you do not need permission from any studio or any one art director to make the things you want to make. Your job is to learn and to have a conversation with the world and yourself and the planet and just make things so that you can interact with it because those things never existed before you actually did them. I think we often forget that there's value in the fact that we make things that never existed all of the time. And therefore, when we go into portfolio mode and we worry so much about the opinion of somebody else, who oftentimes, if I'm honest, has an MBA and doesn't give two shits about art and has no idea, they just want to sell a story, that that somehow is valuable. When really what we do as artists is valuable because it's an empathetic place for people to connect to the world the way that we're connecting to the world. The fact that we have the language and the means to speak back to ourselves and back to you know the world in terms of creativity and the things that we make, that that's a place that people can empathize with and latch onto and feel seen and feel heard. And I think that's more important. That's your job. Now, obviously we all need to get paid. <laughs> it's important. To yeah. <laughs> stuff. But as an idealist, I'm also like, I'm still going to draw fart drawings. I'm still going to draw butts. Why? Because I'm a child and I think that they're funny. And I think the first joke <laughs> we ever told was out of our ass instead of our mouth. Like, I think that that's important because I'm not the only one who laughs at it. And I think that that's what's important is like to remember that play and exploration and the fun of it that drew us to do this to begin with is the part that's important. The other means of making money is the thing that supports us so that we can continue to be artists. That was a very, no, that's a really good answer. <laughs> I love to hear, yeah, I love to hear that. I think because we we need to hear it i feel especially in these like trying times <laughs> but like you know i think no matter how sad and gloomy and like cancellations and mergers and all that like fun stuff like we we are artists because we love making stuff and we ha we have to keep making stuff like i think just to be happy and like you said nobody we don't need any permission to make any of the stuff that we want to make like we can just like we, like you said draw whatever we want to draw which is like really empowering and cool and it's always i i love to hear that yeah and thank you for answering my convoluted question i i was i was i was basically i was trying to take a thing <laughs> that i felt or noticed and figure out how to make it into a question just to get your impression of it because i do think that it was one of the hardest things that i had to get over getting out of school like it was paralyzing feeling like every single thing that i had to put out needed to be something that like someone would hire me for versus the idea of just exploring like like what is my style how do i make stuff learning still like and just accidentally stumbling upon portfolio pieces rather than making everything need to be the perfect thing i guess yeah, no, I, I would yeah. fully agree. I mean, my current portfolio is maybe 10% production work and the rest right. of it is me just like farting around and being like, I thought this, I thought vampires were really cool. So I drew a lot of them and I wanted to explore French vampires from the Rococo period. And then I wanted to explore Hungarian vampires from, you know, the medieval time from the 1300s. And then there's stuff of just like, I just thought it would be really funny if a bunch of people had really long asses and had to use stilts to hold them up. And I just, why? I would much rather, I would much rather get a job that is just like, that's some goofy stuff that is entertaining. And then just let me draw. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we have another question from our patron brother to drummer. I think we've kind of touched on that a little bit, but I think there is like an added layer okay. to this question. Um, how do you feel teaching has changed since you were a student to when you were a professor? The world has moved so fast in such little time. Mm. So I think part of the struggle is like, I don't, I'm not teaching at the same school that I attended. Mm. So that, I think my answer has to have at least a little bit of a, the variation between each school is tremendous. 
but I would say that there are some absolute truths that exist for schools in general. For anybody who's looking to go to school or feels like they're maybe in the wrong school or aren't getting exactly what they want out of it. The school will only provide you as much as it can, and it thinks that a specific structure for everybody will work for everybody. When the truth is, is like you are an individual, and then there's a bunch of other individuals who attend the school, and those curriculums are based on what they hope will work for the general audience. If you are unhappy with where you're attending, then you either need to take more control of the classes that you're taking and fill in the places that you want to learn, because that will lead you on the path towards the kind of work that you want to be doing. But yeah, at the end of the day, any, any school will only give you so much. At the end of the day, it all comes down to your ability to know how you learn and make use of that the most. Ask the questions, bother the teachers, get the information you want, learn the stuff that you want. As to how is it different from when I was in school, I wish I knew. I think the benefit of Art Center for me has been that they've really just left me alone. I kind of went into the class knowing that I... Ne like, I never took a, a character design class. I just did the job and then suddenly was like, I wish I had known these things. So I built a class around that. In terms of my methodology, I don't know that it's necessarily commonplace. I know that when I was in college, there was a really old school method of sort of looking at illustration that was really hard ass and like people would tear, you know, drawings off the wall and people would leave like crying after having worked eight hours on this thing and then here a teacher's gone and torn it off the wall and they're like well that's that's life kid i think that we have become much kinder i mm -hmm. honestly feel what am i drawing i feel that a lot of bad practices in terms of unhealthy sort of derogatory and demeaning methods of teaching have really gone by the wayside it's not quite as common though it does still exist but I also think that part of it has to do with the fact that I'm more interested in in work that the students are that this the work that the students make is honest. And in order to make them honest, my challenges are much more psychological than they are drawing based. Mm -hmm. Because I would much rather them have an an earnest conversation with themselves because that's going to make better work. Now, a lot of people like to sort of talk about how the newer generations are very soft and like they don't work hard. And I disagree wholeheartedly. Like I know what my students go through every semester at Art Center. I see the burnout and it's not because they're soft. It's because they're being expected to learn not only how to draw, but also how to use Photoshop and also how to use Toon Boom and also how to use Maya and also how to use Illustrator and how to paint and how to sculpt and how to, like the amount that needs to be learned nowadays is a lot more than it yeah. was. Yeah. I think that mm -hmm. oftentimes professors forget that. And so that's, <laughs> I love the long butt. I think that that's part of <laughs> something that instructors need to be aware of is that just because it was hard for you when you were in college doesn't mean that it's not hard for these students. And what was easy for you may not be easy for these students. I think we often forget that people are individuals who go through their own growth process and their own struggle. And it's important to sort of meet each student where they're at. Now, I didn't have many teachers who were willing to do that. I had one instructor and she was the dean of my college who basically I went to the, her and was just like, I'm not challenged enough. Like I keep walking into classrooms and this is not to toot my own horn, but I keep walking into classrooms sort of within the top two or three and I can put myself with these other people and sort of learn from what they're doing but I don't feel like I'm being I, I feel like I'm going to fall behind if I really want to do this and the school I went to didn't require portfolios so the range was tremendous and that put me higher up than I probably should have been and so she really allowed for me to make my own curriculum take things without you know prerequisites jump ahead challenge myself by being with like seniors when I'm you know, fourth year students when I'm a, a, my first year. And it really taught me to like draw at a much higher caliber because I was surrounded by people who challenged me. So I was fortunate. I don't think most, I think a lot of teachers just sort of want to do mm -hmm. the job. 
and find those teachers, maybe kind of avoid them. Not that they don't have things that you can learn, but I wouldn't put my earnest sort of intentionality and, and my my hard questions, my scary questions, my personal questions, I wouldn't ask to that kind of teacher. I would try and find an, an instructor who very evidently cares about the students individually and wants to be an aid to your finding your way to do the thing that you yeah. need to do. Yeah, it's very much a like you 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 catch more flies with honey than with vinegar situation. Like there are, there are teachers that can be too soft. And I think it's important to be the kind of student who's going to be like, Hey, can you like push me a little bit more on this? Like know what your limitations are. Know when you need to be pushed, know when you need a break. Like it's just about communication. And I think removing the fear of, of anybody in these, in, in these sort of relationships is really important. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I can ramble. No, but... you're okay. No, that's great. That's like, I, you know, you actually said something that I didn't really think about before where you were saying like, you didn't really feel challenged because you were kind of like at the top of your class. And so you, you went into like classes where like other students were, well, like senior classes. And, and I never really, you know, I always, people who've listened to the pod who know my personal lore, they've heard me kind of like say things like, oh, when I was in Goblin, everybody was older than me and I was terrible and it was hard because I felt like I was like behind and I, and blah, blah, blah. But now that I think on it, I'm like, well, maybe that was good. Maybe that was a good way to push me to kind of work harder in a way. Because I've always kind of thought about it in a light that was negative and or I guess self- pitying but now i'm like well maybe that was actually a strength i we have a great question from a uh, new ground okay. alistair is asking is overworking a necessary part of the creative process or is it possible to organize a project pipeline in a way that avoid those stresses i love this question i'm gonna be really about <laughs> it the time that it takes if a producer tells you that it's not happening fast enough or that you don't have the budget then that's the producer's solution like thing to fix it takes the work that it takes now i've worked in this industry i guess long enough that like i've never once come across somebody who is just being lazy for the sake of being lazy and collecting a check that is not what is happening if it is taking too long that has something to do with a greater problem that is either that things were not prepared properly, that the information was not readily available, that there's something bigger going on in the artist's life. But if if it comes to overwork, never overwork. Do the work every day, eight hours, be done. If it takes longer, yeah. if it takes, if it if you guys go over budget, that's that's for the production, that's for the the showrunner to figure out. If if they picked a style that is going to take too long, then that's on them. Asked to do mm -hmm. a specific job. You are asked to complete a specific task. And it is not up to you to care more about the production than you do your own life. I love that answer. There go. I, I agree. I, I am just going to repeat what you said. But I, I do feel like a lot of the time, I mean, I think people listening to the podcast have probably seen these threads on Twitter that have been floating around um, a couple of years ago where it's like comparing backgrounds from TV shows between like, I don't know, like let's say Ed and Eddie and you put that next to like Amphibia backgrounds and it's like, what happened? You know, one of them is like a children's book finished illustration and the other one is like a little bit more designed and more obviously the Ed, Ed and Eddie one is like the, the the more simple one, but it still looks great. And it's like the expectations are so know, high you, for every for every but, shot, even if it's like one second, like it's like uh -huh. some beautiful, crazy background that you see for one second. Exactly. And it's like, is it really worth it? Is it really worth spending hours and hours and hours of time painting and rendering and, and drawing all these details that most people are going to see for just like a second? Yeah. Yeah, it's it's a hard one, and I also understand why it's a hard position for a young person to be in, because those are the those are the guys that get asked the most to kind of like 
push those extra hours and prove, and prove themselves, right? And mm-hmm. the other and and the excuse that a yeah. lot of younger people make for themselves to to work those longer hours is I have to catch up to what my superiors can do in a faster time. And if they've realized that I work slower than the other people, I'll get fired. And that's, that's such a challenging mental obstacle course to work through as like a younger worker, you know? Oh yeah. Say though, even production is going to be like, Oh, well, like you're putting in added hours, especially if it's not being asked of you only serves to make you look like that is the amount that you are capable of producing at any one point in time. And you might be burning yourself out and killing yourself. Like you need to be aware that like making production aware of what your limitations are and what your capabilities are is part of the job. It's super important to be really clear about what you can do in an allotted amount of time so that they set the expectation correctly. If they set the expectation that you can accomplish a tremendous amount because you were doing all that extra work, then they expect that that's how much you can get done every single week. Be honest about what your capabilities are so that you don't break yourself. Mm -hmm. Too many young artists I have met have like blown out their arms or have busted wrists because they've overdone it for themselves. And I somehow managed to be able to work a full-time job and draw while I teach 20, 30 hours a week. But I'm also very intentional with like knowing how I'm drawing, knowing how what my limitations are, knowing what my flow or what my speed is every day. It's about learning how to work smart versus working overtime. You think like, oh, production is going to see this. Oh, my, my art, run, art director is going to see it. Oh, my showrunner is going to see it. They're not. They have their own lives. They're busy doing other things. They care about hitting the deadline. They care about doing it to a specific level of polish. And then everybody gets to go home and sleep and rest and do whatever else they want. So don't break yourself. No show is so important that you need to hurt yourself for. That's so true. That's so good. I agree. Working smart instead of working hard. I'm like, I got I joke around to people that I'm kind of lazy because I but I'm just like I just wanted the biggest bang for my buck you know I'm like yeah if I could get like a really good pose to do the work of like three drawings you know like I'm I'm talking for boards obviously you know like I would rather do that I would rather just do one single really good drawing than three drawings that I kind of eh but take more time to to draw in the end from YouTube Sakuna Ruful. What is your favorite memory of working on the Cuphead show? My favorite memory of working on Cuphead. Oh, I thought I, th- I really enjoyed working on that show. Uh, it presented a lot of challenges in terms of new skills. I'd never done effects animation or before. And uh, getting to like sit down with Andy, Andrea, um, our art director, and like, pour over so many different effects from Popeye to Fantasia to old Mickey from like the 1940s and 50s. Like looking at the references that the Cuphead animators were using and then trying to find the best solution for like what the animators could do on our show was really, really fun. I mean, so many, so much of my day, every day on that show was I probably spent an hour every day just watching cartoons from that that time oh, that's period. So cool. One of the coolest things I learned, especially like watching so many of those old cartoons, was realizing that so much of our animation nowadays, the animation is so limited, mostly because we don't value the same thing that they did in the 1940s. Like the gimmick of animation was so new in that period that like the point of the short was not to have like an emotionally resonant effect, but to really like showcase what the animation could do and to surprise the audience with gags. And I had forgotten how much I really loved cartoons as a kid for just the fact that they were funny and surprising and that the animation could allow them to squash and stretch and like really make some goofy choices. So I particularly loved the research aspect of of that show. I also just thought it was like a really healthy team. At least that was my experience. I, to be fair, I also was like the only 
in-house like character person or not character props and uh, effects person so i was a team of one and only worked with the art director and we had a great time that's so fun <laughs> nice yeah it was, it was yeah. really enjoyable but it was really fun to just be like oh cool i can't solve this i guess i'll just go walk into like dave wasson's office and be like dave what are, what are you thinking about for this scene like how did you envision this and so having the freedom because i felt like everybody was on the same page for trying to make as beautiful of a, of a show as we did that it just it made going into work every day really fun because you would just walk by and see gorgeous gorgeous work and then also have like a team that was really supportive and like everybody was super on board with making really cool work and I don't know it was really fun I mean I I don't know about UV Land, but like the show that we were just on like our our character team on that like it's the most supportive team I've ever been a part of. They're oh, the art was so good too. God damn it! it as like you guys, like you guys' work was just like just so fun and observed and like quirky and like I don't know. It was just really fun to 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 watch. Well, I'm glad. But yeah, I would say like like this team is for you and I at least at least for me. I think that that Cuphead was just a really healthy team that was really, really encouraging. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, like that was the most fun part of it was we knew we were making something that looked really cool. We knew we were making something that didn't feel like anything we'd seen in a long time, but also we were all excited and we all liked each other. Ah, uh, that's a good feeling. <laughs> yeah, that was the thing. Yeah, we did have a really good career on that show as well. I feel I feel pretty lucky. I feel like overall in my career, I've been mostly on shows where like people were were great. So that part, I'm, I'm very thankful. We have another question from Instagram. Inc. KG is asking, are there any fun stories doing prop design? <laughs> oh, so many. Um, <laughs> I think people often think about props and are just like, it's just random stuff. And you're not wrong. It is just like anything that's going to be animated that is an object is needing to be designed, right? But sometimes you get some real goofball things that you never really thought you would ever have to design. Like, I don't know, I had to design a tandem bike that was homemade for Cuphead uh, and Mugman to ride around and that thing required so many special oh poses. God. Just everything's <laughs> overlapping, you know? Everything's overlapping. Bikes are really hard to draw. And this one was made of like two bikes that weren't a tandem bike originally that are held together by rope and like hammered in pieces of wood. And it was so elaborate and so over the top. And I just like, it was, it was a goofy, goofy drawing that, Ultimately, like, I still give Dave and Cosmo, like, a hard time to be like, you guys have no idea what you did to me. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like bikes and cars and any vehicles are already, like, a huge pain in the ass. Yep. So if they're, like, homemade. Bi it's bikes like... were the first thing that an art teacher in school was like, if you can figure out how to draw a bike proportionally to how someone's body is then you've come a long way because it's so hard it was like the first thing that was flagged to me as being difficult yeah yeah it's 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 a tough tough gig uh but then like it goes from things as like complex as that to then also being like all right cool you're going to do you know this is a, a slice of cake that's been demolished like smashed into somebody's face and you get to draw like particles of cake like smashing over a character's face and that stuff is gorgeously fun. Not <laughs> only is it gestural, it's also really abstract. And so to be able to play with something that is representational, but only just barely, is one of the most fascinating challenges I think I had. Because it's this combination of, of prop design and, spe and the end effects design that, like, ugh. I don't know. I think I think I've really come to appreciate and love particularly like crumbling and falling apart pieces of, of food. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny. Lots of respect for effects animators out there now as well for that reason. But 
Yeah, I really, I, I love designing food and I love particularly designing it in a special pose where it's crumbling. That's, that's like, ugh. Dude, when, when a show, when a show, uh, yeah. did you have a show that has represented food in, in a, a favorite way of yours? Like some shows make it look so delicious. Um, I, honest to God, anything Studio yeah. Ghibli, like food wise. I, I mean, I mean, it's the easy answer, but also it's so true. Like, Oh, it's delicious. As far as shows, otherwise, other non-Japanese shows, Ratatouille does an excellent job. Obviously, they they really studied the heck out of it. In terms of like funny food, like SpongeBob's Krabby Patties, like the close-ups and like how detailed all of those get, like loads of fun. Ed and Eddie did a pretty good job with like the Jawbreakers. There was a lot of like, I don't know, they would everything had this sort of like wonkiness to it and it always had like some sort of hole taken out of it mm-hmm. so i like i like those it also just depends like stylistically you can watch like old disney animations and like there's some gorgeous food in a few things there but like like sword in the stone has some stuff that i like there's also just like the old disney shorts there's a there's a ton in there as well someone just made recently like a twitter Posts about like how Disney used to have product placement, and one of them was with shoot, I forget the brand, but it's a brand that does like mostly like crackers and little like chips, like snacks and stuff. And they did really <laughs> go ham on making these like products look really good. <laughs> I mean, like the money was depending on it, you know. So, <laughs> what do you guys think is the secret to? making food look delicious in a cartoon i have actually theories on this <laughs> yeah no no i want to get into it because this stuff is, i love this stuff so i think the reason why like specifically ghibli's food looks really good applies to also how they do their characters where everything is just a little bit more plump than it needs to be. Mm-hmm. so it has this sort of like more rounded sort of bouncy effect but everything is connected with an s curve rather than like a sharp sort of angular angular thing yeah when they do their clothing all of their clothes also feels like there's like a slight breath of air or like a puff of air that's sort of pushing into the costuming that it's it just sort of brings this like childish gummy bear like nostalgia to things that I think is really effective. Like everything has just sort of got these soft little edges that. Yeah, I agree with that. I will say, I think on top of it, because there's like a, a manga I used to read. Let me see what the title is in English. And he draws the food extremely well because the whole point of the manga is like the Sarariman is every, it's like a lot of short stories and so the Saturday man is like either on the way to work on the way back home or whatever it's like a little downtime in his day and he's like oh I, I I'm gonna stop by this little shop or by this little uh, supermarket because I've heard the, the food here is really good and then the whole little short story is him ordering the food and describing the food and then you see a lot of pictures of the food and the not what uh, screen tones on the food are so mm-hmm well done where it's like shaded in the perfect way with the little shine on the food that makes the food very shiny and i don't know if that's where i'm like yeah. that's the good food their use of highlights is yeah <laughs> let me see it's kodoku no gourmet and i don't think it's been translated you have to go on to a manga that it hasn't been translated in so I will yeah, check. so this will be for the diehard food fans out there who want to really yeah I'll just deep dive. write it right here perfect it's funny because this um particular mangaka I'm talking about extremely popular in France oh. but not not very not very much translated here in the U.S. Do you have a favorite French comic that you're into recently? Someone that I think is very much overlooked in France. Uh, by Americans because he's a newer artist is Riyad Satouf. I think his work is so funny. He's such a great writer. He also does movies. He has an amazing autobio comic which would translate to the Arab of the future. Mm. 
It's really, really, really good. It's about his experience, like, you know, being born in France and moving back and forth between the Middle East. Mm. Uh, is it the Middle East? Yeah, no, 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 maybe North Africa and France. It's really awesome. And his drawings are so funny. They're, like, very charming. This looks great. He draws kind of like, I was just kind of, like, paste it here. He, he draws like this. Ah. You know what I was watching recently? I, I don't... I'm probably gonna butcher the pronunciation, but I typed it in the in the chat. It's a uh, a French a film about a queen who is in love with death. It's so good. I don't know if you've V. Have you seen? Was it Bovinrian? Bovinrian Nexas. It is beautiful. It is so beautiful. It's also been banned in a lot of places because it's very por it's like pornographic too. It's pornographic and violent, but it's. Yeah, that's I guess from the because if you translated the name of it that you just typed, it would translate literally as in like vagina queen of ecstasy. Dude, it, it, it is it is <laughs> it is beautiful. It's it, but yeah, I, um, for for a, anybody or vaginet, I guess for for anybody looking to look it up, make sure that you have a parent or guardian, even if you're of even if you're of age. This style is absolutely incredible i have never heard of it this is. before i mean i'm not surprised i hadn't heard of it before because just of the nature of the name it's like it feels like it's very niche and like it's it's not it's not very long but v, v let me know when you watch it. It, it dude it is amazing it is amazing wait when did it come out because it looks kind of modern but it could also be from the 80s not I sure know. i when will is... i'm going to write it just for uh, once again guys uh our tour listeners this is a very it's an adult animation but it is i really like boundary pushing animations that reaffirm that animation can be adult and and should be able to be considered adult on certain instances and it is it is a good example of that mm -hmm. It, wow that's amazing yeah, it's basically about this queen that happens to be there during the time when death comes for like the old king who dies and she falls in love with the grim reaper basically and so she keeps killing to meet him again and again and so uh -huh. she can you know fall the in love with death wait that's a that's a goblin yep movie yeah that came out in 2023 okay that's very uh recent okay i was like yeah the art looks looks extremely modern very yeah, cool. cool wow cannot wait to watch it adam last question do you ever have creative block and if you do what do you do when you struggle with it figure drawing uh yeah <laughs> off, off, <laughs> some figure drawing certainly helps oftentimes i th there's a few things that i think cause artist block one of which I think number one is that we are bored. Number one, I think we have mm -hmm. creative block is that we are not being challenged enough to try and find answers or solutions. Therefore, that's typically like why I think like trying a new pen or trying a different kind of paper or trying a different texture oftentimes will kind of get me out of it. So if I ever get into a creative block, which I think is happening less and less nowadays, but I think that has more to do with the fact that I understand myself more effectively. I feel like I would go through these sort of like, mm -hmm. I would call it like a, like a roller coaster where like I would be climbing and learning and then I would hit this peak and be like, oh my God, my drawings are so good. I finally understand. And then suddenly I would hit this like downward spiral of just like, oh my God, my drawings suck. But it was mostly that I was just bored of making the same decisions in my work Mm -hmm. that that's what caused me to dislike the work that I was doing. So there's a possibility of it being that. And Lord knows that's not me saying that like art block isn't also other things. I just know for myself in a lot of cases, it was that I just needed to be stimulated in another way. Then there's also like burnout, which is a very different thing. And that is when you have you only have so much sort of gas in your tank, right? Mm -hmm. If you are overworking yourself, you know, we all have a certain amount of creativity that we can get. If that amount goes down and then every time you try to, t like you get a little bit of creativity and then you feel this need to like keep retrying, like, oh, okay, it's back. I need to like 
make a good drawing now because I'm drawing well and effectively and I'm not so tired right now. That's a really bad decision. And the reason it's a really bad decision is that you have only just gained a breath of creativity again. Mm -hmm. So what's important to do is to allow yourself to go outside, take in some sunlight, sit in the grass, feel with your senses and absorb and consume life in a lot of ways before you're able to ex execute sort of creativity again. You need to fill back up before you can put anything back down on paper. Go outside, mm -hmm. observe the light, feel the wind on your skin, feel the grass, appreciate the present, breathe, and don't feel guilty about it. Know that you are just recharging your batteries and then go back once you have refilled enough. Uh, I have a lot of students that have really gone through a lot of burnout and especially because they are typically within their last couple of semesters and they're trying to get their portfolios ready for graduation that, you know, whenever they have a break, I'm the first to be like, don't, don't draw until next semester. Like you're going to have plenty to draw next term that at this point, like give yourself a space to breathe, give yourself some time to just consume energy to put back into your battery so that when the next semester comes, you are, you have a full tank. You're ready to, to execute. That is a rare teacher take. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I feel like I've never had a teacher say that to me. I like that though. I think that there are students that you're like, that you can also tell that you're like, okay, you've just like, you've spent yourself and like you are working constantly so hard and have all these ideas and have all these things that like, there are students that need that. And then there are other students that need to be like, Hey, how about stop, stop focusing on like your hobbies and focus on the thing that you want. Because right now, you know, there's, there's a time and a place. A lot of the student, like, like I said, a lot of the students that I'm working with tend to be the students that are a year from graduating and want to like go out with a bang. And then it's this constant fear of like, well, have I done enough? This isn't at the level that I wanted to be at by the time I was supposed to graduate. And then they just start beating themselves up and jumping onto their sort of own panic and their own discouragement doesn't benefit them. Yeah, It, it makes things worse. Mm -hmm. It makes things harder. And it makes them feel a lot more insecure and frankly, I think a lot of that's why a lot of students, when they graduate, they and there isn't work out there for them to take. That's when we lose a lot of potential artists, is because they haven't been taught to rest. They haven't been taught that like life doesn't go on, like that life doesn't continue after you graduate. They they think that it's only that or get a job, right? So if a job doesn't come right away, we've the amount of friends that I went to college with that burnt out that never became artists within our field that could have all had to do with the fact that like they didn't learn how to take care of themselves they didn't learn how to value mm -hmm. rest they didn't learn how like they just eventually burnt out because they they didn't like themselves anymore they didn't like their lack of success they didn't like their burnout they didn't like the fact that they didn't know how to teach themselves you know they they became bitter and angry at themselves and i don't want that for any of my students so if it's a matter of just telling them like hey take care of yourself first the work will come and when it comes like you'll be ready for it but like yeah don't break yourself for it as so you true. as you guys have heard tonight i'm very big on like a balanced life <laughs> no it's no yeah. it's good it's a hardest thing that we try to go for you know i mean to be honest, like the reason the reason why like I I teach more than anything is like I as well as I'm sure all of all of us who've worked in it for a while like we see where there are problems in our industry and mm -hmm. the fact of the matter is that there's a lot of challenge of how do we fix these things. Well, so much of those things that can be fixed is by just teaching the younger generation that's coming in not to accept things that are unhealthy, or to teach them that they need to be humble or they, they well, not, not humble, but to teach them to be afraid to talk to their art directors 
I want to remove for my students the stigma that they can't ask questions. I want them to seek mm -hmm. out the answers they need from their superiors in their industry and not feel like they have to overwork themselves. I want them to be trained on how to live a healthy lifestyle so that they don't make the same mistakes that all of us have made by just sort of going through the motions and doing the things that we were told to expect and that we are being ungrateful if we don't work overtime. Like, no, there's a union for mm -hmm. a reason. There's a healthy way to do this. And if I can train my students to expect to be treated well, then they will ask to be treated well. And that will benefit them in the end because they will also have the work ethic and the knowledge to seek the answers they're looking for and prove that they're living a healthier lifestyle and being able to answer the questions more quickly and more succinctly ultimately helps the team rather than them breaking their back, trying to yeah. prove that they deserve to be there. I agree. That's so nice. That's really good that you're kind of teaching that like mindset. I do feel, I hope that like that can be something that is more prevalent a little bit, that kind of mindset where it's like doing the work well, doing the, by, you know, kind of going straight to the point and asking questions and making sure that, you know, you're also like, I'm yeah. you go at the door, like you're trying to find these answers because you need to get the job done. Not right. because you are, <laughs> you're so smart and you just know everything. It's like, no, there's a time and a place to, to stand up for yourself. And part of that is like, you're seeking answers. You're not, you're not trying to direct right away. Yes. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. Wow. So much wisdom. I think this is such a a fun episode that we've covered so much great grounds on like all of these topics and like philosophies of on drawing and, you know, looking for gigs. Thank you so much, Adam. Oh, dude. Thanks for having me. Such a blast. I mean, the fact that we started talking theory the other day and then we get to finish talking theory tonight and, just be, and get to do it with sean like this is a, this has been a blast talking shop talking shop i enjoy i love talking shop well that's the end of this creative block adam thank you so much for being our guest and sharing your story oh, of course. any any time uh is there anything that you would like to share or promote no i mean i'm i guess if anything i'm also a huge believer in like there's nothing to be afraid of in terms of reaching out to your idols in terms of this career. Like we're all just a bunch of nerds and a bunch of geeks who really just like drawing and telling stories. And if you're a student, you also probably feel those same things. So please feel free to like, not only reach out to me, but reach out to other artists and like become part of the conversation. Like we are as excited to find new talent and new voices as you guys are to like see us do work. So I think it's important to like remove, again, I want to remove the fear. So if you guys want to reach out, uh, my Instagram is just my first and last name. I don't post art there anymore because AI, but simultaneously, like I, I'm going to practice what I preach and make myself available if you guys want to have a chat beyond just this this podcast that is super kind of you and uh let me remind our listeners that they can reach out to us as well on social media at crtv block where we ask for drawing prompts and questions to ask our guests as as well as any other questions that you might have we'd love to hear what you'd like to see uh on on the show who you'd like to see on the show and if you have any questions just in general we want to hear what uh, you think and also thank you also huge thanks to our editor clements for editing the podcast marco for helping us produce the show and abuka for creating the short clips that we've been putting out if you love our show you can support us on patreon patreon gives you early access to episodes and access to our discord community another great way you can support us is to like subscribe uh, leave, leave comments and click the, the bell. There's a bell so you get the notifications and you don't miss any of the new hot creative block wisdom. Click the link in the description of this episode to follow Adam Dix on all his socials and to find our Patreon. I have been your host, B. And I've been your host, Sean, aka Lord Spew. Keep being creative and we'll see you next week. Bye! Bye.